Now to come back to that agents fact of it is by lengthening under resistance, we're adding more collagen to the tissues of our muscles and connective tissue. Now collagen helps muscle tissue reduce the risk of injury. Now here's the other thing, collagen also helps your skin look younger, right? So if you're doing multi-planar, multi-directional exercises with a little bit of intensity, with a little bit of load, carrying a light dumbbell or just even moving your body weight, if you're moving in multiple planes, you're underneath the skin, you're working on the connective tissue that surrounds the muscle fibers. But on the surface of the skin, you're stretching the skin in different directions, which is gonna cause more collagen. Your, your muscles will produce something called fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are those little itty-bitty cells, like satellite cells, that if your muscles move in different direction, your fibroblasts will add on and make those thicker and more resilient. Same with your skin. Hey there, I'm Amy Connell. Welcome to Graced Health, the podcast for women who want simple and grace-filled ways to take care of themselves and enjoy a little chocolate in the process. I am a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach who wants you to know your eating, movement, and body don't have to be perfect. You just need to be able to do what you're called to do. Welcome to season 12. Today, we start uh, airing new episodes again. Thank you for tuning in to season 11, where I re-released several meaningful episodes. And based on the download no download numbers, you enjoyed those as well. So thank you for tuning in. I hope they blessed you in either new ways or renewed ways. Today, I welcome back to the show, Pete McCall. You met Pete in season nine, and he is here again to discuss some of the surprising benefits of high intensity exercise. And I'm just going to tell you right now, if you like younger looking skin, and I'm raising my hand, then you're going to want to tune in. Because <laughs> we talk a lot about skin and uh, the benefits of intense exercise and what that can do to it. Pete holds a master's degree in exercise science. He is an educator to fitness professionals like myself. He's also an international presenter, host of the All About Fitness podcast, fitness blogger, and author of several articles. He's also written two books, Smarter Workouts, The Science of Exercise Made Simple, and his new book, Ageless Intensity, High Intensity Workouts to Slow the Aging Process, just released this week. Uh, it is the perfect combination of exercise science. And you guys know that I'm all about geeky exercise science. And I say that in the most respectful way. But it's the perfect combination of that and just really applicable information. It is chock full of workouts that you can do either with your own body weight, or a few simple pieces of equipment. He breaks it down for you provides clear step by step instruction. And if nothing else, get it for the workouts, because I uh, highly recommend all of the stuff that Pete puts out with with regard to workouts. Well, really everything. Anyway, it is specifically designed for people over 40. And if you are wanting to move your body in a way that will age you well, I highly recommend it. And of course, the link is in the show notes to Ageless Intensity and Smarter Workouts. Now, before we get to Pete, I want to remind you of the resources page over at gracedhealth.com slash resources. Whether you're looking for food, fitness, or faith-based support, I have you covered. You'll find uh, all kinds of different things, including a 14 day devotional, my family's on the go protein powered breakfasts. I will be making a whole lot of these in preparation for the upcoming school year. Uh, I have a download of how to enjoy shame free health by breaking eight rules and my latest workout offering squat free strong legs. Again, that's at gracedhealth.com slash resources. Okay, let's bring on Pete. Pete, welcome back to the Grace Health Podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Amy, it's such an honor to be here and to have an opportunity to share a few things, a few insights with your listeners. So thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. 
Yeah. Well, I'm really glad you're here. And I want to say congratulations because this is airing on August 3rd and your second book, Ageless Intensity, just released. So I want to spend um, the bulk of our conversation just kind of talking a little bit about what is in that book. Um, I am 40, how old am I? 46. I forget sometimes. <laughs> You've got, I don't think you'll mind me saying that you've got a cu- just a couple years old on me. And mm-hmm. um, so we're right in that age, right? Like we're in that age where we're coming out of, you know, exercising and all of that for looks and we're looking toward the future. And I just love all the things that you have out there on your all about fitness podcast. And then in both of your books, smarter workouts and uh, ageless intensity. I was wondering if you could start off with just kind of telling me a little bit about the genesis of ageless intensity and what why you wrote it, what's it about and why you wrote it? Well, how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> um, <laughs> it was talking so one of the, one of the things, Amy, that got me really interested in this topic was right after I graduated from college, I was looking for a way to stay active, a, a way to kind of meet new people. I'd moved back home, moved back from Southern California, where I went to school, back to D.C. And after spending, I did my semester abroad in London, where I'd watch a lot of rugby on TV. I got to see rugby being played at, at a very high level, the professional level in England. And so at 22 years old, I, I went out and started playing men's club rugby with the Potomac Athletic Club in Washington, D.C., which little did I know, but was at the time was one of the top clubs in the United States. I mean, they the following year, they won the, the, the club championship. Um, and, and so I didn't know I was going out to play rugby and I didn't realize I was playing with kind of an elite level club. And what I saw where I'm going with this, what I saw was here I am 22 years old you know, very, very uh, full of myself to say. And I saw these guys who are in their late 30s and even early 40s. They're these men. I shouldn't call them guys. They're men. They're these men in their late 30s and early 40s that were extremely fit, extremely competitive. They weren't paying. They weren't playing for a paycheck. They were playing rugby because they loved the sport. And these were guys who at, at 22 years old, I mean, these guys were 15, 16, 18 years older than me. I mean, literally beating me into the ground and and really running circles around me and was just it, it was a kind of at that time. I, I remember like in the summer of 94, in the fall of 94, when I was starting to play, I just kind of had a switch in my head. Go, I want to be like them when I'm their, their age. I want to be as fit as them. I want to be as competitive as them. And rugby has a great ethos of old boys rugby. There's over 35. There's over 45. I was talking to somebody yesterday who's getting ready to go to an over 50 rugby tournament. I just played an over 40 rugby tournament not not too long ago. So I started seeing it at that time. And then the other thing that I think is germane, you might be able to to relate to this, is I didn't start my fitness career until a few years later when I was about 26. And I went through, I got my indoor cycling certification through spinning. I got my ACE certification. And I remember teaching my first few indoor cycling classes and talking to a few of the members afterwards. They were in their 40s, late 40s, early 50s, you know, old people because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> back then I mean what in my mid 20s in my mid you know I was like 26 27 anybody over the age of 40 was old oh. but here I was and because you know when you're an instructor you start you want to do everything by the book so I'm talking to these people I'm doing the carbona formula I'm taking their heart you know what's your age and what's you know what's your age in this and, and and saying well here's where your heart rate should be based on your age 220 minus age which we now know it was just inaccurate and so I would tell somebody who's in their early 50s, who's a cyclist and works out regularly, I'd say, well, this is where your heart rate should be. And they would look at me, Amy, and they would go, I barely feel like I'm sweating at that. Like, I don't feel like I'm working that. You're telling me I should be at, at 150. And they're like, I'm barely breaking a sweat when my when my heart rate, you know, because this is what right when polar heart rate monitors were coming out. And so we try to encourage the use of polar heart rate monitors in the cycling program. And they'd be like, I barely feel like I'm sweating. I don't feel like I'm working until I'm in my 160s. You know, and here I am. I'm like, oh my God, your max heart rate's 220. Your max heart rate's 170. You know, but that's where I realized that that's between the playing rugby, playing competitive rugby with guys in their in their 40s when I was in my 20s, and seeing that the data didn't line up between what we're told in the textbook and what people were were showing me on the fitness floor. That's when I just started paying attention to maybe it's wrong, maybe it's not, maybe what we know about exercise and aging isn't quite accurate. 
That makes a lot of sense. And I, I completely relate to that. Well, this is what it says. And if this, you know, this, this is where you should be. And these are the numbers. And yeah, it is. And that was that was around for a really long time. So it's, um, it is interesting. And I'm, I'm noticing that in myself as well. Because uh, well, I'll go out there and do um, my favorite exercise of the moment is to do hill sprints. And I'll take my heart or I, my watch will tell me what my heart rate is. And it's probably it's not quite in line with that 220 minus your age. Uh, but my heart's in good shape. And I've been moving it for a long time. So uh, yeah, I can I totally understand uh, what you mean by that. I want to well, um, well, oh, go on. well sorry, and, and it would go. But the other thing is, Amy, is when I started looking at the research, I don't know, a few years ago, before, before I started getting into writing ages, I realized that a lot of the research on older adults, and I've, I've spoken about this on my podcast, but a lot of the research on older adults were done, have been performed on sedentary, inactive older adults. And when they do research, they might take a group of six-year-olds or might take a group of seven-year-olds and have them do strength training for eight weeks. So they might have them do cardio training for 10 weeks. And, and just for listeners, it's interesting to note that study periods usually line up with academic semesters. So when they do a study, it's somewhere between about six and 12 weeks because that lines up with an academic semester and, and the, it's the grad students that are really doing the nuts and bolts data collection. So anyway, just, just so you know. So what they're doing, so what I realized is a lot of these studies on older adults were done on deconditioned older adults. But if you go back and you look at the, the, the modern fitness industry, and this is what I like speaking about with Dr. Natalia Petrozella, who, who, who's a historian working on this. And if you go back to the modern fitness industry, it goes back to about the late 1960s, early 1970s. So if you have somebody that was 25 years old in 1975 and got their first membership, gym membership back then, and they've been working out for the last 45 years, and they're now 70 years old. Well, we don't really have much data on that. We don't have much data on somebody who's 70, who's been fit their entire lifespan and who strength trains and cardio trains and does, and does that regularly. There's not a lot of research out there on it. There just really isn't. And, and so that's one of the things I wanted to, for Ageless Intensity, is I wrote it specifically for that population of people like us between the ages of about 40, early 40s and, and late 60s, early 70s, people that have been working out. I've had a gym membership or worked for a gym since 1990, going on 30 something years, right? And I know many of your listeners that are into exercise, they may not have been as consistent as they would like to have been, but they probably had a membership throughout their life somewhere. And so that really is who the audience is for. The audience really is, if you're exercising and you've been fit and you, you enjoy fitness, but it's like, okay, I'm in my 50s now. I don't want to listen to a little 20 something and no offense to 20 somethings out there. But if you're in your early 50s, getting your fitness advice from a 24 year old isn't really what I would recommend. It's just not, you know. Um, so yeah. anyway, that's what I wrote the book about was was the from from a fitness junkie who understands the research to for other fitness junkies who just want to they, they just because you're a certain age. I mean, heck, I saw Stevie Durant play elite competitive rugby at the age of 52. I saw Mick Carey play in the USA Rugby Super League at the age of 50. Just because you're, and we can see Tom Brady. We look at Tom Brady right now, who's 43, 44 years old. You know, it, we, oh, we yeah. just, if, if you exercise your entire lifespan, those numbers don't mean anything. They really don't. The age does not mean anything about what you can't, about your ability and what you can or cannot do. Right. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I, so just for the listeners, so they know, um, you, were able to provide me an author's copy. So I was able to look, you know, read your book a little bit ahead of time. And one of the things that I love um, about the content of your book, and I want to get into the, <clears throat> excuse me, the structure of it later is you're really kind of opening our eyes of those people who have been moving for a while of um, the benefits of exercising and how it can um, enhance the aging process. And there's a lot of really surprising benefits in there. I mean, I, you know, you and I have worked together on some various projects and, you know, I was wondering if we could go a little bit over there because, or go sure. through yeah. some of those, because I think, um, I think that that and some of the things might be surprising to my listeners. And one of the one of them that I want to start off with uh, that as a woman who is constantly looking for products for her face, 
<laughs> hey, guys, I, come on, guys. That's that's what I got for. I remember recording. We're recording this. That's what I got for Father's Day. My my uh, my my kid's mother. Like, what what would you like for Father's Day? And I just said, well, I do need more like face cream and stuff. So, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it goes both sides of the street there, Amy. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. I do forget all of that. But talk to us a little bit about how um, exercise and specifically the high intensity exercise can affect our skin as we get older. Okay, a couple different ways. Number one, that's a great question. I love that. And, and if you have a primarily female audience, this, this again becomes one of the re- reasons why we should be doing high intensity. But women will produce more high, more growth hormone, more human growth hormone as a result of strength training or high intensity interval training. And human growth hormone helps build muscle. That's one of the things it does, but it also helps metabolize fat and it helps the skin look healthier. I mean, a lot of times, and I'm pointing south here, we're, we're, we're recording this on video, people will go to La Jolla or people go to Boca Raton or people go to Beverly Hills and they go to a doctor who's a quote unquote anti-aging specialist. And besides Botox, one of the top injections people might get is injections of human growth hormone. Well, I, that's, I don't know about getting pharmaceutical growth hormone, but what I, what I would recommend is doing a 20 minute hit workout where you get out of breath and you're a little bit sore. That's going to create, that's going to cause the body to create its own growth hormone. And the, the research, the research shows that people in their sixties and even early seventies can still elevate levels of hormones naturally when they do the right types of exercise. Including um, high intensity exercise and strength. including specifically high intensity exercise. When they do, when they do high intensity interval training, the body will produce more, men will produce more testosterone and women will produce more growth hormone, even in yeah. the later years. It's just the body needs the stimulus, right? And that, and that's, and when you look at high intensity exercise, and this is for your listeners, if, if they've been strength training or exercising for years, when there are two, there are two components, to hormones being effective. Number one, when you have a short-term response from exercise, you will elevate levels of growth hormone or testosterone. Over the long term of exercising, your muscle cells create more receptor sites, more receptor cells. And so that way, over the long term, so it's one of those things, if people are starting to work out, hormones are not really going to have that great of an effect on their body for the first maybe six to 18 months from what, from what we've seen, right? When we first start training, we're expending more energy where our body's adapting to it, our nervous system is adapting to it. But over time, we're also increasing the, the receptor count on the muscle cells of the sites where the hormones interact. So that maybe a year, 18 months into higher intensity training, now when your body does produce more growth hormone, there are also more receptor sites for that grow, growth hormone to work more effectively. So that, again, that's where why when you look at exercise, I, listeners, I hate to tell you this, you can't just do it a couple months and stop. Yeah. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. If you want, if you want to be ageless, if you want to be, if you want to experience the benefits, it needs to be consistent. You know, week in, week out, year over year. Are there going to be periods when when life gets a little in the way a little bit? Absolutely, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's going to happen during certain times of the year. But in the long run, we want to be consistent. Forty eight, fifty weeks out of the year uh, of trying to push ourselves a little bit. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, and that's and that's a reiteration actually of one of the, of what you had talked about on the previous time uh, when you came on. You're like, just don't stop, just don't stop, keep it going, keep it going. And I love the science that you provide with that. That after six to eighteen months, you do have that receptor, and then you're going to receive those benefits even more. I'm just thinking about just yesterday. I was at the gym, and I was working out, and there's a guy there who I have to imagine if he if he was. If he wasn't 60, I mean, he, he looked to be mid to late 60s. But this dude was, I mean, part of my, I'm, I'm going to be very technical here for listeners, but this dude was jacked. I mean, he looked to be in his <laughs> mid to late 60s, lean, muscular. And where I live in San Diego, we get a lot of retired Marines. We get a lot of people for a lot of people from the Marine Corps and from the Navy that retire here. So I assume when I see somebody older like that in the gym that they're probably retired military. But I almost interrupted him to ask him, like, can I ask how old you are? Because I want to be like you when I grow up. And, yeah. and what I mean by that is you see this population now of men and women um, who are in their later years, in their 60s and 70s, who are still really fit. And, and I don't know about you, but that just motivates me you know, to, to say, hey, they, they can do it. You know, the science doesn't isn't quite caught up to them yet. Right. And that's yeah. what happens in the fitness industry is it's kind of like you have your, your gym science. And then the lab coats come along and say, well, this is why this is happening. 
And, and so that's just to point that out. I mean, I get I get encouraged and motivated by people like that to say, hey, I want to be like you. <laughs> Even at 49 years old, if you're 20 years older than me, I want to be like you when I grow up. Because I just I see it just almost every time I go to the gym, I see somebody who I know looks at about 15, 20 years older than me that really just is demonstrating it. Not just, you know, so it's not just theoretical, but I see it in action. And I think it's really helpful too, to see that. I mean, it's just like we're seeing in advertisements, you know, wider range of bodies and, you know, you, you, you can't envision yourself doing it unless you've seen it. Now, I mean, sometimes you can, but it's really helpful as well to say like, oh, well, there's another woman who's been moving her whole life. And wow, she is moving so well and she is vibrant and, you know, high functioning and, that is a great incentive t- for me to keep going um, because then because then I can see it and I can see myself in that rather than just saying, well, I hope this works out and I hope I'm not just totally, you know, totally breaking down my body. Now we can see that, oh, no, actually, you're not breaking down your body. You are doing more for it. Well, and, and that's just, but that's where exercise needs to be smart, right? Is right. Yes, you want to do high intensity exercise. But, and I'm very specific about this in the book, that doesn't mean every day. <laughs> yes. Just, just because I'm an advocate, and I want to be very clear, I'm an advocate of high-intensity exercise. However, I mean, and, and what we had an exchange, I think with an email exchange a, a couple months ago, where I, I mentioned, yeah, I was reviewing, yeah, and I, I had an email exchange. My workout for the day was going for a three-mile walk, a three, three-and-a-half-mile walk around my neighborhood, right? Yeah. And, and there, I think we need to, especially as we get a little bit older, I need to respect the fact now I got some arthritis in my knee. I do get, if, if I do too much without the, the proper recovery, my back does hurt. <laughs> you know, So I want to be very clear that I, just because I'm an advocate and I am a huge proponent of high intensity exercise, I am a, just a big proponent of a good walk <laughs> or, Absolutely. or a good yoga class because those are essential for the aging process as well. Yes. And that is a great caveat. I'm really glad you said that. And so I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but I want to ask you anyway, how many times a week would you recommend someone do, um, do high intensity exercise? I, about two or three high intensity strength training workouts. And I'm, I'm a big fan of total body, right? I mean, mm-hmm. and that's, that's the thing we need to kind of reset our mind around, especially those of us that kind of came of age in the eighties where we had Arnold, and maybe maybe we bought the Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. Maybe maybe we we've read various magazines over the years that that focus on bodybuilding, where you do one muscle group at a time or one body part at a time. But when you look at aging well, I really want people thinking about doing the movement patterns: the push, the pull, the hinge, the squat, using multiple muscle groups. Primarily, our workouts should be primarily standing on our feet because when we're standing on our feet, we're using more of our core muscles, especially the muscles that stabilize the spine, the muscles that move the hips. So I'd much rather have somebody do a full body workout, do it heavy two or three days a week, and then do one or two days a week of high intensity interval training. And all that, so you might do two heavy strength days, two hit days, and that's four days in there, right? The other three days you would do relatively easy, easier exercise. That's where the walk comes in. That's where a yoga class comes in. That's where just a movement class, maybe a dance class comes in of where you're just moving to, you're getting your heart rate up by, you know, going to old school. I mean, we're talking in this demographic, old school jazzercise, old school um, dance aerobics, because you're getting your body, you're getting your heart rate up and you're moving in multiple directions, but you're not doing it necessarily with load. Okay. So you talked some about the, um, the skin and, um, the benefits that we get with that. Let's talk some about cognitive function, because this is something that I have been learning more and more about. And, you know, as someone who's aging, and of course, I don't know if you have this or not, but I know, um, I deal with it and I, some of my listeners do too, because they have admitted to it, but you know, you walk into your a room and you're like, what did I come in here for? What did I want? And then there's that fear factor of, oh my gosh, am I losing my brain? And, and is my cognition going down or my memory is going or, you know, like there's that whole rabbit hole, but talk to us a little bit about the cognitive function and, um, and how our brain actually responds to exercise. Cause I think this is really interesting. And so I'm, I'm laughing with you because just, just, I, I mean, no, I, I am not, this is a hundred percent serious. Just the other week, I was looking for my sunglasses, and they're on top of my head. You know, I, I, like, where are they? I, it was—I mean, it wasn't like super long time. It literally was like thirty seconds. I'm like, where? Oh, 
and they're right <laughs> on top of my head. And I mean, I, I so I, I totally relate to you. And it's just, you know, the, those are those quote senior moments. But here's the thing. Here, here's what they're starting to look at when they look at high intensity exercise is it produces something called brain derived neurotrophic factor. And there's another um, VGEF, and I forget what that stands for, but brain derived neurotrophic factor and VGEF are proteins. BDNF, BDNF is a uh, neurotrophic that stimulates the production of new brain cells. And what they're seeing when it, when it comes to high intensity interval training specifically, so like a 20 minute HIIT workout will elevate levels of serum BDNF higher than a 40 minute moderate intensity workout. And, and that really is, is there have been a couple of studies that have repeated that. And there have been one or two research reviews that compare high intensity interval training to moderate intensity exercise. And the reviews are pretty conclusive that the higher intensity exercise creates more of a BDNF response. And, and BDNF, if it grows new brain cells and what VG, I think is VGEF, but what VGEF is help promote the growth of new arteries and new blood vessels in the brain. So one promotes the growth of new brain cells the other one promotes blood distribution and blood flow in the brain. Well, if you can do two 20 minute HIIT workouts a week and get a little shot of, of BDNF in, in there. And then the other thing too is doing different movements and doing different movement patterns involves coordination, right? And that's the other reason for training from standing on our feet is when we train standing on our feet, we're using more muscles. When we use more muscles, the brain has to work harder because now the brain is communicating Hey, you know, glutes, I need you to keep it. I need you to work a little bit harder because we're lifting something up overhead or mm -hmm. deep spinal stabilizers. Hey, guys, we're doing something from a standing position. I need you guys to turn on and be a little bit more active. So if you if you do different types of exercise and you challenge yourself to learn different types of exercise, like maybe and that's what I write about in the book, maybe you do six or eight weeks of barbell training. OK, great. By the eighth week or so, your body's kind of used to that. So what should you do? Maybe shift to six or eight weeks of kettlebell training. The first couple of weeks, you're going to be a little uncoordinated because you're like, oh, wow, I got to learn. You're learning new movements. You're learning new techniques with a piece of equipment. But then after a course of like six or eight weeks, your brain has learned something, learned a new pattern. Your muscles are working differently. You're working at a higher intensity. So you're getting those benefits. Then what should you do? Pick up some dumbbells or maybe pick up a TRX or just do something differently every eight, six, eight, ten weeks or so. And then that way, what you're doing is you're not only putting different stimulus in the muscles, but you're challenging your brain to work differently. So you're recruiting and engaging different muscles and getting different firing patterns, what's called firing patterns in the motor neurons that, that control the muscles. You know, it's funny. Um, I was telling you before we hit record that I am working, we're recording this in the summer and I have been doing my teen classes and I had them do uh, you're familiar with this, but dead bug. So that's yeah. where you lie on, you, you know, you lie on your back for those of you who aren't interested or who aren't um, familiar with it. And you take your hands up and your knees kind of in a tabletop position and you drop one hand and one leg and then the other, and it blew their minds. <laughs> so that's a really great one to do uh, for, for cha challenging that brain as you go for sure. Okay. Any other um, general, I mean, I know there are some more, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about um, some of the just general how we age benefits to um, exercise and specifically the high intensity exercise. And I do want to clarify as you're talking, you're not only talking about HIIT training, which is more um, cardiovascular or, um, you know, purely like just movement, but you're also talking about strength training when you talk about intensity. Is that correct? Uh, no, uh, Amy, thanks for clarifying because 100%, because a lot of times, and, and I've seen this in the gym over the years, is that it's what I call the groundhog day. I write about this in, in the book. It's the groundhog day effect of where you do the same thing over and over again. And when you, when you do the same thing repeatedly and expect different results, that's the definition of insanity, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, also and not only groundhog day, but I call it the Caddyshack effect because, and, and one of the things about the book that, and I don't know if you picked up on this. Yes, I, I did. Use 80s <laughs> movies, I use different eighties movies to make, to make various references. So if you're of the same age, and, and like, so Caddyshack, where I'm going with Caddyshack is I remember growing up in the eighties, Caddyshack, it seemed was on, was a Sunday night movie of the week, like every other month. And, mm -hmm. and I can't tell you how many times I've seen Caddyshack. And I think it's entertaining. It's funny. There's so many memorable lines, but over the time, after watching it for so much, you're, you just don't get the same stimulus from it. 
your brain stops react. You don't react the same way that you did the first or second time you saw it when it was unexpected. Well, the same sort of thing happens with exercise in our body. If you do the same exercise over and over again, at the same intensity, it has less and less of an effect. And if you do a higher intensity exercise where you're fatiguing by six reps or you're fatiguing by eight reps, then you're challenging the body to work harder than it's normally used to doing. So if we're used to, if you go to the gym and maybe you do, I do 12 or 15 reps because I want to do light weights for high reps to tone up. Well, let's up the, let's increase the, the resistance a little bit. The rep range is going to come down. You want to work to a point of fatigue. Well, now you're working harder and you're working differently. And that is high intensity training and, and working to a point of fatigue. I want to be very clear. It's working to the point of fatigue that the research shows is what initiates that hormone response, right? Doing 12 repetitions doesn't really do much for you if you don't reach fatigue by the 12th repetition. Doing 20 repetitions won't do much for you if you don't reach fatigue by the 20th repetition. And so you can ask yourself, what would you rather do? Do 20 repetitions to fatigue, which can be kind of uncomfortable, or do six repetitions to fatigue? Either way, the goal is get to get to a point of momentary fatigue where you cannot do another repetition. That, according to the research, is what stimulates the growth hormone and the testosterone response for men. And really, and that, that, that's really what I want to be clear to is when you do strength training, it's to the point of, I cannot do it. I, I have to stop now because I cannot complete another repetition. That, that's where we want to be with our strength training. So as you're talking, Pete, just because I've done, I've done some research, putting it into my own book. One of the things that's coming to me is I really having a good identification of what your goals are, because there absolutely is value in strength training to, you know, 15 reps. I mean, I, I typically am like, if you can do 15 reps without ease then or without problem, then you probably need to be, you know, increasing, start with 10%. But I, I want to make sure that people don't feel like, okay, well, I'm not getting any benefit if I fatigue at 15 reps. It's just maybe a little bit different goal, more for um, that strength, but less hypertrophy or something like that. Would you agree with that? Because I want to make sure that I'm not off. Yeah, no, I, I would, that's, that's, I'm, thank you for pointing that out because you're right. Goals have to dictate that, right? And, yeah. and what I really want people to think about, though, is as we get over a certain age, 50, 60, wherever we might be, that while looking good is still important, what's, what's more important is using exercise to manage the aging process. And that's yeah. where, where we're working to a point of fatigue, according to the evidence, is what can do that. Now, if somebody's out there and wants to do 12, 15, 20 reps and be like, well, this is what I want to do because, you know, and I don't want to go into all the things, but are they still getting a benefit? Absolutely. They're still getting their heart rate up. They're still, the muscles are still working. They're still getting a health benefit from that, right? But mm -hmm. is that going to have the same response as going to a point of fatigue or working to be slightly uncomfortable? And, that, and that's one of the things that, that when, I, when I lecture to fitness professionals, one of the things I tell fitness professionals is that as a trainer or as, a, as an instructor or coach, our job is to help people be comfortable being uncomfortable because right. it's that discomfort which causes growth, right? Going, doing that extra rep, doing that extra set is going to be a little uncomfortable but that's what causes growth. And that's what stimulates the changes within the body. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, thank you for clearing that up. Okay. One of the things I'm shifting gears just a little bit. Sure. One of the things that I really learned uh, in reading through ageless intensity is um, not learned, but was reminded of is the benefits of power training. And I have to admit, that's not something I do a whole lot of. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what that is, how to do it, when it's appropriate to do that? Because I, you know, you do say in there, you're like, don't just jump in and start, <laughs> start power training, but teach us a little bit about power training. Cause I thought that that was a really interesting section of your book. For your listeners. I mean, I, we saw a great, uh, this last year in, in the, in the Super Bowl, we saw two phenomenal example, two phenomenal examples of that. Was it this year or last year? I think it was last year. With Anyway, J-Lo, Jennifer Lopez is what, 51, yeah. 52 years old. And she looks absolutely amazing. Well, what's dance? Dance is power. Dance is explosion. When you do a dance routine and you're doing a jump or you're doing some movement, or you're doing dynamic movement, that in essence is power training, right? And I'll, and I'll qualify that a little bit more. And then when you look at Tom Brady, Tom Brady at 42, 43 years old, preparing for football is explosive power training. He's probably going to be doing more explosive movements 
like a jump or a sprint or a throw, like a medicine ball throw, then he is lifting a tremendous amount of weight for his position. So what power training does, so strength is force production. Force is mass times acceleration. Anytime you pick up a mass, you pick up a weight, you're accelerating that weight. Your muscles generate a force to cause that weight to move. That gets into the, you have inertia, body at rest stays at rest, muscles apply a force, you move the mass, you cause an acceleration. Well, power is work over time. And work is defined as force times distance. So when you move a weight a certain distance, you're doing work. You, know, you can move it however many inches during a repetition. You do it at times a certain amount of repetitions. That's your work rate. That's what we kind of tend to do is work rate. Well, power is where you do more work in less time. And one of the things you're doing with power training is you're causing the muscle motor units to work faster. If you're doing strength training and your muscles start shaking a little bit, even if, even for listeners, if you make a muscle contraction, make a biceps contraction, hold that. After about 20 or 30 seconds, your muscles will start shaking a little bit. Those are the muscle motor units. Those are little nerve endings, which cause the muscle fibers to contract. Now, if you do an explosive movement, maybe you do a jump, maybe you do a medicine ball throw, maybe you do a sprint. I, I love the fact you're doing uphill running. If you do a more explosive movement, then what you're doing is you're telling those motor units to work faster, to work more explosively. What that you're doing is you're engaging the type two muscle fibers. That's then the type two muscle fibers for, for listeners you that's what leads to muscle definition when you look at track athletes when you look at certain athletes and certain dancers they may not train for definition but one of the reasons why they achieve definition is the nature of their activity is using those larger type 2 muscle fibers more explosively and that really is it and then we we don't do that enough as we age we're told don't jump and that, that is one of the things that caused me to write this was a few years ago um the the uh, association of chiropractors came out with some nonsense where you shouldn't be doing jumps or squats if you're over the age of 50. And it's kind of like, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> it's kind of like, no, you should be. Now it doesn't mean you do a 24 or 30 inch box jump, but two or three jumps in place will help work on the explosive nature of the muscles. So that way, if you do heaven forbid, get tied up over your feet and you start falling or something, your muscles know how to react explosively. The other benefit of, of power training is you work the fascia and the connective tissue. Because when you do a power exercise, the muscles don't actually lengthen and shorten. The muscles will stay, the muscle fibers stay contracted. It's the fascia and the connective tissue which lengthens and shortens around those contracted muscle fibers. So that's what can reduce injury as we age. One of the, for example, and, and um, I was just, uh, where was I? Oh, I was, in, uh, I was in Boston a couple weeks ago for my rugby tournament. And I was talking with uh, one of the top strength coaches in the Boston area, a guy by the name of Tony Gentlecore. Tony's about 43, 44 years old. And he's written about this on his blog and he's been open about it on social media. So I'm not sharing any privileged information here. But a year ago, Tony was doing sprints and blew his Achilles tendon. And that's a very, yeah, the, the, that Achilles tendon injury, Amy, for, for men between the ages of 35 and 50 is extremely common because they don't do, they don't do enough explosive training and preparation. And Tony admitted that he had kind of skipped on his warm up that day and was doing a pretty gnarly change of direction drill. And just he muscles weren't warm. He wasn't fully prepared for it. And it, it blew. I mean, he blew the Achilles tendon. But doing the reason why I say that is doing some power training one or two times a week. Doesn't need to be every day, not every workout, but doing some jump training, doing some skips, doing some explosive running one or two times a week helps increase the resiliency of the connective tissue and reduces the risk of something like a muscle strain or a pull when you go out to play your favorite sport like tennis or maybe shoot baskets or, or maybe kick a soccer ball around with their kids. So doing that type of power training allows you to maintain a higher functional capacity longer well into your, into your later years. Yeah. Well, and I love what you talk about with, you know, being able to catch yourself when you trip, because I feel like we are at the point where just as often as we might be injured doing something exercise, maybe even more so it's because we're tripping. It's because we are off balance and we try and catch ourselves. I mean, it's, it's the, it's the getting out of bed and, oh, I tweaked my back or something like that. I mean, these are the kinds of things that I'm seeing in my clients and seeing and hearing about in people I'm speaking with. And that is becoming more of an issue than actually getting injured because you you know, lifted too much or something like that. It's life, right? Like we've got to prepare ourselves for life. Okay. 
Now you talked about the fascia. You say fascia. I say fascia. Tomato, tomato. I don't know what. Exactly, yeah, it's the same. <laughs> Potato, potato. As long as you spell potato with an O and not an O-E. And not <laughs> uh, I'm, 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 yes, I just made a Dan Quayle reference. For listeners, that is a reference to the former Vice President Dan Quayle. But, well, we I are children of the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get into mobility. Uh, mobility is something that I have really embraced. I It's I, it's probably my one of my favorite ways, one of them, I guess, of moving right now. And I have yet to be able to figure out a way to precisely explain it to people. And um, I have tried in many, I've made podcast episodes about it. So I would love to hear you explain what mobility is, and just some of the benefits of it, because I want to, I want to talk a little bit more about mobility, and especially how it relates to your fascia. I know I, that's such a great topic, Amy, and thank you for asking. And, and it's funny because I'm actually working on a blog post this afternoon on, on mobility because you're right. We're used to stretching, right? We, when you hear somebody say flexibility, you hear stretching. That was, especially if we're a kid of the 80s, what do you do? You run two laps and you do 20 minutes of stretching. Well, holding a muscle in a lengthened position. So if you do like a hamstring stretch and you hold your muscle in a lengthened position for 30 to 45 seconds, the muscle's lengthening because you're desensitizing the motor neurons. If you're basically what you're doing, the technical term is autogenic inhibition, is you're kind of turning the muscle, quote unquote, off. You're telling the muscle, relax, I'm not going to use you. So normal traditional flexibility with static train, with static stretching, the idea is if you lengthen the muscle, you allow the joint to move through a more complete range of motion, is full structural range of motion. And every, every joint structure has a designed or an intended range of motion. Can you control the range of motion that, that you have? And can you move into a new range of motion? Can we work on coordination? Can we work on that? So when we look at this, if you lengthen a muscle, that's called extensibility. Flexibility refers to the joint motion dictated by the structure. So muscle lengthening is extensibility. Flexibility dictate, is dictated by joint structure. The combination of the two is mobility the ability to control movement through a range of motion. That's the way I look at mobility anyway. Yoga is a perfect mobility form of mobility workout, right? And and they don't classify it as that, but really what you're doing in yoga, if you have a good instructor, is you're flowing from one pose to another. You might do a warrior two to a triangle to warrior one or might something like that. And and that's what, when I've done yoga consistently, that's what I've enjoyed about it is you're moving, you're transitioning from one pose to another you're controlling joint motion, you're controlling tissue elasticity, and you're moving into that. And that really is, when we look at exercise, I mean, some of my favorite workouts, Amy, are always mobility workouts. Yes, I love I love picking up a heavy barbell. Yes, I love a, a kettlebell or throwing a medicine ball. But one or two days a week, I'm just doing mobility stuff. I might be rolling on the floor looking like a turtle stuck on the on my back on the <laughs> I might be but I might be doing some walking agility where I'm doing some hip mobility I, and for anybody that goes to a sports game uh, a sports um, game if you get to a basketball game or a football game earlier and you see the athletes doing these like what looks silly little things on the they're moving around they're doing their mobility exercises uh-huh. mobility in the sports world is called prehab or warm up it's called prehabilitation or it's just they're doing a dynamic warm up but what you're doing is you're controlling movement through space. So in an ideal week of workouts, you do a couple of heavy strength training workouts, a couple one to two metabolic conditioning, like high intensity interval training workouts, and then one or two workouts of just your body weight, where you're doing the mobility training of controlling your body through space and allowing the joints to experience their full range of motion. Tai Chi is another one. As I kind of show one of these two of these movements on video, Tai Chi is, is an amazing mobility. And when you look at that, I mean, I I think that the Asian cultures have been doing this for thousands of years because they understand that moving your body through space can help you maintain your, your ability to function as you age. And I think that that's a reason don't there, aren't there several blue blue zones that are in, in Asia. And I have to imagine that that's a reason why. Okay. Now I want to talk to, I'm going to go back. Um, a little bit about the fascia because my understanding is mobility will, it kind of stretches and moves your fascia in a lot of different directions, which also helps prevent injury. So 
talk a little bit about that if you don't mind, or maybe that's just where we go with that. But I think it's, that's the kind of thing that I think is really helpful for people to hear because once they're at a point, they're like, okay, I'm moving and I want to, you know, I want to keep moving. It's then how do I not get hurt? And how do I not get injured? And I think I get a little, maybe overly focused, probably my, my female clients are like, I'm tired. I I, I mean, not I'm tired, but I'm tired of hearing you say, I don't want you to get injured. <laughs> you just tell me, do it, you know, have me do something. And I'm like, no, I, cause if you get injured, then all of this just goes to waste. So talk a little bit about, um, about the importance of mobility as it relates to fascia and, um, injury prevention. Well, real quick, I, I want to highlight that, right? You just hit on something very, very important, Amy. And that's for years, especially for for, our age range, we have had this belief that no pain, no gain, that pain is weakness leaving the body, that that we want to, if we're not a little sore, then that wasn't a workout. And and I just want to say that that there's nothing that can be further from the truth. If if you're having one of those days where you've hit every red light, you you, you got those phone calls that just made your blood boil a little bit, or maybe you and your spouse aren't really on the same wavelength, you're grinding gears a little bit. And you're not 100% into it. You're not. That's not the day you should go your hardest workout because if you're not 100% focused on what you're doing, you could risk injury. And you're right. I mean, at the age of tw- at 25 years old, getting a little nick is not a big deal, right? You're gonna you can work through that. You'll you'll feel better. It doesn't matter. At 45 or 55 years old, getting a little nick or, <laughs> yeah. or getting a little kind of muscle, you're kind of like that doesn't feel right. That's going to that's going to kind of keep you from doing your favorite activities for a period of weeks, even a couple of months if you don't don't treat it right. But when you look at when we look at fascia, fascia really. So muscle fibers get stronger by contracting against resistance. If you're picking up a heavy weight, like say you're doing a deadlift, you're moving a weight vertically up and down. And for if, you, if you're listening, you can't see me doing this on the video, but you're moving a weight up and down against gravity. Muscle fibers are contracting to generate the force to move that load. Now, if you take a light medicine ball, and that's one of the reasons why I feature that in Smarter Workouts, if you take a light medicine ball, or even if you just take your body weight, now you're moving through space. You're not just lifting up and down, but now you're moving through space. You're going to be lengthening the connective tissue. And fascia connective tissue, we can also call it elastic connective tissue, that gets stronger by lengthening under resistance. Now, to come back to that, that, that ageless fact of it, right, is by lengthening under resistance, we're adding more collagen to the tissues of our muscles and connective tissue. Now, collagen helps muscle tissue reduce the risk of injury. Now, here's the other thing. Collagen also helps your skin look younger, right? So if you're doing multi-plane or multi-directional exercises with a little bit of intensity, with a little bit of load, carrying a light dumbbell or just even moving your body weight, if you're moving in multiple planes, you're underneath the skin, you're working on the connective tissue that surrounds the muscle fibers. But on the surface of the skin, you're stretching the skin in different directions, which is going to cause more collagen. Your, your muscles will produce something called myofibroblasts. Uh, fibroblasts are those little itty bitty cells, like satellite cells, that if your muscles move in different direction, your it, the fibroblasts will add on and make those thicker and more resilient. Same with your skin. Your skin. So that's where, if you look at, and for listeners out there, we all know somebody that's a little bit older than us that maybe does a lot of yoga, maybe they do a lot of dancing. Or maybe they're martial. Maybe they do martial arts, but you're like, man, what do they do for their skin? Because they look so young. Well, that multi-directional movement is going to create a younger, youthful, more uh, more youthful fascial architecture, and their body's going to be producing more collagen than somebody that's just maybe is sitting at home on the couch. Or if they do exercise, they're doing the same repetitive motions on machines. That is fascinating. And what better reason to continue doing mobility? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm running out of time, but I want to give you a chance, if you don't mind, to talk about the structure of your book, Ageless Intensity, because it's it's structured some somewhat similarly to smarter workouts, but I want to really make sure um, that people can understand what they are going to benefit from it, because I think that there is some gold in there, and I cannot wait to uh, put it into practice. Oh, well, thank you. No, and, and for what I try to do with it is I give a little bit of the science, um, and also I too, I go into a little bit of the history about the last 40, 50 years of fitness. Uh, and I talk about some of the trends that we've experienced because I wanna set the stage that whatever got you into fitness to begin with, whether it was you know wanting to look like a bodybuilder, whether it was wanting to look like a model, whether it was you know, 20, 15 years ago is when CrossFit started becoming popular, 
in the mid 2000s. So whatever got people started on their fitness journey, I kind of wanted to acknowledge it and say, no matter what got you here, as we move forward, fitness becomes the means for managing the aging process. So I go through the different how how strength training does that. I go through what I call metabolic conditioning, right? Because if, we, if we're breathing, we're doing cardio. <laughs> cardio is oxygen coming in, CO2 going out, carbon dioxide going out. Met- metabolic conditioning refers to you're using one of your three energy pathways. Are you aerobic? Are you anaerobic? Or are you where you get in into the stored energy pathway? It's where is it? Where is the source of muscular energy coming from? So I go into a little bit of the science of strength training. I go into a little bit of the science of metabolic conditioning about how that affects. And according to the research, and again, this research is pretty is evolving. There are a couple of studies that have come out in the last two or three years, which really show, give us a really good understanding about how this type of exercise benefits us through the aging process. And then I do a couple of chapters on workouts, but for listeners, I already talked about, I don't talk about muscle isolation. If you view, I don't like, for example, there are no, I don't have any, in, none of the workouts feature biceps, curls, or triceps. If you still want to do your biceps curls, by all means, do them, right? If you want to do your triceps, do them. But the workouts I'm trying to get people thinking about are based on the movement patterns, based on using heavier loads, and to the point of, and also to respecting time, right? We don't have hours a day to spend in the gym, but the workouts are designed to get in and out in about an hour. And that includes changing time. That includes warm-up time. And your, your workout should be about 40, 45 minutes. Because that's one of the other things we've seen with, with, with the research is you wanna, you, if you want to elevate T levels or you want to elevate the anabolic hormone levels, the workout should be a little bit shorter and a little bit more intense, and we reduce those rest intervals. So also the workouts are designed to be kind of like circuit training or at least supersetting where you're doing a push exercise and then a pull exercise or a lower body exercise followed by an upper body exercise. And so I state that at the beginning of the exercise section of this, let me be very clear, these are not workouts for bodybuilders. These are workouts for people who want to achieve what's called successful aging. And successful aging is aging free of disease and while maintaining optimal cognitive and physical function. And that really is, and that's that's what the workouts are designed to achieve. I mean, if you want to do bodybuilding workouts, please, by all means, do that. Um, that my, my book's not a resource for that, unfortunately. But if you want to learn how to use strength training and mobility training and metabolic conditioning and how that can slow down aging, well, that that's that's the resource that I put together. Yeah. And it all goes back to like what we were talking about a second ago. It all goes back to what are your goals? And I think you and I have very similar goals. Like we just want to age well and we want to be able to move well and we want to be able to, I mean, I like your, I think you shared in the last episode that you were on, on, on here that you wanted to compete in the, in the, uh, senior Olympics and, you know, racing. I, I think that's what it was, right? Sprinting, the hundred yeah. meters. <laughs> yeah, I, the hundred, yeah, I might have to I join you. <laughs> I got 20 years before I started entering the senior Olympics when I, when I turned 70. And, and so yeah. I got, I got a 20 year, I got a 20 year training cycle that I'm on right now. And, yeah. And I, but in, but joking, in but the I'm meantime, kind of yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the meantime, it's like all I about said, moving your body to, to age well, to get to that point, to be able to do it. So you don't burn yourself out, you know, on the inside as well as, as mentally for, for sure. Okay. One piece of advice you might have for someone who is wanting to age well. Be active every day. Yeah be active every day. Now that now it doesn't mean exercise. I, I want to be hundred percent clear. That doesn't mean exercise every day, but at least a 30 minute walk every day, get your heart rate up. All the experts I talked to on my podcast, Amy, I asked them kind of the same thing. And, and it comes back to just being active every day. Doesn't mean you need to get out of breath every day. It doesn't mean you need to go to a point of discomfort every day, but get your heart rate up a little bit every day and get your breathing up a little bit. Just breathe a little bit quicker every day. Those days yeah. that are really busy take the stairs, we'll take a 10 minute walk here and there. And, and that it, from what I've read, everything I've read and everything I've achieved up to 48, almost 49 years old is just having that mindset of being active every day allows you to do that. Yeah, it totally does. Pete, thank you so much. Tell people how they can get in touch with you. Absolutely. Uh, my website is Pete McCall fitness.com. Um, if you go there, uh, if you sign up for my mailing list, but I try to put up just one or two emails a, m- a month. And really, again, the focus is on using exercise as successful aging. So you can go to PeteMcCallFitness.com. You can listen on the All About um, All About Fitness podcast. And I really appreciate the opportunity to promote that here, Amy. Thank you. And I love what you're doing. And, and when you're ready with your book, I'd love to have you on, on All About Fitness and have you come share kind of your experience with the listeners. And then, too, I just uh, put up uh, YouTube. I think you were talking about that a little bit, too. 
um, put up YouTube information. Uh, the Instagram handle is all about fitness podcast. And, and with that, I'm trying to I, I'm just really trying to put information out there that people could use as opposed to say, hey, look at me. And that's where I kind of I was like I was at a point of like the stuff I'm putting up there is more. Hey, look at me. And that's not what I want to do. I want to put stuff out there that's like, hey, how can we all get better together? What here, here's an idea for getting better. And I just I need to do a better job of, of messaging that. Yeah, it's it's uh, well, I think you're doing a great job with that. And uh, just a plug for the newsletter. Um, I always learn a lot. And I think you put some really quality information on there. And I think the timing of that, I mean, you have it once or twice a month. And I think it's great whenever I know, you know, I see it come across. I'm like, okay, this is going to be good. You know, sometimes you get these newsletters, and you're like, okay, you know, do I want to take the time to read it? So your your information is quality. I think you're serving your community really well. You're helping um, fitness professionals like me learn and then also I know just the, you know, the fitness enthusiast as well. So um, you're doing great stuff. I'm so excited for Ageless Intensity. I wish you all the best of the luck in the world with it. And uh, thanks again for coming on. No, thank you for having me, Amy. I always enjoy our conversations. So thank you. I always learn so much from Pete. I hope you did too. One of the things that I really appreciate about what Pete is doing is he's really getting that exercise science and data and all of the stuff that goes along with that and helps us to implement that so we can live vibrantly, so we can uh, do what we love doing and really focus on that rather than what we look like. And, you know, let's be honest, I still care what I look like, but I care more about how I feel. Ageless Intensity is really a wonderful resource. I encourage you to grab it. Of course, the link is in the show notes. Don't forget to check out the goodies over at gracedhealth.com slash resources. And if this show is valuable to you, would you offer me some value and rate it and review it? It's a free podcast. I'm so grateful to be able to offer that to you. But little things like rating and reviewing or sharing with a friend or over on social media really mean a lot. Any of those are helpful and appreciated. What's the one simple thing to remember? This is something I try and do in every episode because we talk a lot and I try and bring it down to one simple thing. And that is don't be afraid of high intensity, which we actually didn't really say specifically. But if you listen to this thinking, eh, I don't know about high intensity, don't be afraid of it. It may be just the thing to help your body age well, so you can move and function in a way that brings you joy and allows you to do what you're called to do, which you know, we are all about that over here at Grace Health. Okay, that is all for today. Go out there and have a great day.